Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we continue on our journey to be gracious to me, which is the words from Psalm 41. And let me recap where we're going. And by the way, there are 13 verses in case you're wondering uh, how long this psalm goes. And we're going to take this all the way into Easter. But let me read up till now. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. Our text for today. Sinned against you. As I opened up in the beginning of our service here as an introduction, you know, it's an interesting phrase to hear that. O gracious, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. That's not hard for us to say, is it? But to put those words in the mouth of Jesus and say that's what he said, human reason doesn't really take us there, does it? Because it just seems a little contradictory. Well, today let's walk through a little bit with King David and where he was at. Because from our Old Testament text, you sort of got the idea that he was in a state of grief. He had just heard the news that he was going to lose his son and had lost him. And he died, his firstborn from Bathsheba. Now, as we go through this psalm again, just as a reminder, this is really, when we talk about Christ, we're talking about us because we are united in one body, as is said in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. We are one. Hard to even ascertain that, isn't it? But yet in baptism, remember, we, our old Adam dies and we are raised a new creature in Christ. We are the body of Christ and we are one with Christ. As he bore our sins, we bear Christ in our hearts and in our minds. So that's how we take it as we go through. But King David, as you know, as a shepherd boy, grown up to be king, receiving just a lot of glory, and then, of course, sometimes power corrupts, doesn't it? And ultimate power, power often ultimately corrupts, as we would say in the secular world. And he had his eyes on Bathsheba. And think how much joy he had, of course, when he met her and when he found her. But he said, you know, Lord, be gracious to me, for I have sinned. Because Nathan approached him. And you remember the parable that Nathan gave him about, you know, you have a lot of sheep. Say one person has a lot of sheep, but you want that sheep over there. And you take that sheep. And David says, oh, that can't be. We should execute that person. He said, you are that man, as you know, recall. And yet he had this glorious wedding day where he walked down the aisle, as many of you have, or many of you might, maybe will, in your future. And he was in such a state of joy with Bathsheba. Yes, he had Uriah killed. Yes, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Yes, Nathan pointed out his sin. And yes, in sackcloth and ashes, he came with a repentant heart. You know, prepare me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. He repented for his sin. Yet a sin wasn't without consequences. And that's the sad thing often of life. As he saw his newborn baby, as he put his hands around that little baby's foot, our hand, you know, think of the joy he had for yet only seven days of life. And as our text ended, it was was read from 2 Samuel today, you saw and you heard that he actually was fasting, praying to the Lord in case it was God's will to actually sustain the child, even though Nathan told him there would be a consequence for the sin he had committed. And so after fasting and after having the will of the God revealed to him that his son indeed would die, he began to eat because he knew and with great confidence said he will see his son, his child again at the resurrection. You know, he knew that. And so we also have confidence that when we have a baby that's born and isn't baptized, and they're born from you, from Christian parents, or for those that we know that are Christian parents, we can be rest assured that the Holy Spirit works faith in that child, can work faith in that child, because of the parents earnestly praying for the health and the spiritual well-being of that child. And yes, we try to get them baptized, but it's faith. And when we say, when Christ says, believe and be baptized and you shall be saved, well, belief can happen in an infant, in a fetus, before baptism. And that's our assurance that we have as Christians, that God can have mercy on those that die before their time, before we have a chance to hear them confess their own Christian faith. And so David saw the impact of his sin, and he was in great remorse, and he said, Lord, you know, be gracious to me for I have sinned. And he knew it, and he felt the consequence of that sin in his life. And yet, 
what did God say through Nathan? He said, here's a blessing that's going to still come to you, King David, because from your house, from your kingdom, will be a king that will last forever. He was forecasting, as you can read here in 2 Samuel, the coming of the Messiah will come out of his kingdom. The throne will never leave King David's lineage because the Messiah is to come. And that was a great blessing that he received. And yes, the great king was to come, born of a virgin. The great king was to sit on the eternal throne forever. What a beautiful thing that is. Now this great king was to also say these words. He didn't say them in scripture. He said them through the prophet David. And I want to read from Acts 2.29 that talks about David as a prophet. It says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and he was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Acts 2.29-32 And seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ and that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay speaking of Christ and his resurrection. David had that promise given directly to him. So sometimes we wondered, you know, what did the Old Testament patriarchs really know about Christ? Well, they knew quite a bit. And in David's case, it had been revealed to him very directly that the Christ was coming from him, the Christ that was to bear all things. Now, Christ, when we talk about this, we talk about the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. I'm going to read you just a few things. One, he took up our human body, frame, and likeness, incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. Those are the words we just got done saying in our Nicene Creed. He fully submitted to all the challenges of human development and growth, including his need for family endurance. Thus, in Luke 2.51, it says, He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. In other words, he honored his father and his mother and his family. He cared for his family just like we care for his family. He was fully human. He also experienced the full range, as you know, of human emotion. Weeping at the grave of Lazarus, John eleven thirty five, 35. Getting angry at the money changers in the temple and casting them out in John two fifteen, And being sorrowful, sorrowful even to death, death on the cross. While in the garden of Gethsemane, he lamented, Matthew 26, 38. So now we come to sin. Human thinking says in every respect he's been tempted just as we are. That comes from Hebrews 4. But then, surely, he must have had some kind of advantage, right? He was sinless, and yet it says, I am sorry for I have sinned. And we know the answer because I was talking about that at the beginning, that he bore our sins. So we should not think in human reasoning that he didn't feel the impact of sin. It's hard to reconcile what that must have felt like in the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know. We don't know, right? We know how guilty and shameful we feel when we've just committed maybe a sin that's just poignant, still stinging in our hearts and our minds. Well, think of him feeling all sin from before him, feeling the sense of all guilt and shame of all sin after him. All sin he bore. And we know that because when he went into the Jordan River to be baptized, that was a representation when the Holy Spirit came down on him that he was bearing, the sin bearer was being announced to the world by John the Baptist. Your Lord truly did and still has absolutely no sin of his own. But it is written, in him there is no sin, 1 John 3, 5, and he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, from 1 Peter 2, 22. Again, it is written, he has done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, Isaiah 53, 9. Yes, indeed, he committed no sin. But just because he didn't doesn't mean he had and carried no sin. Difficult to ascertain. Scripture says, in him there is no sin, but it doesn't mean that there was no sin on him. John the Baptist was faithful when he said concerning Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away, who picks up, who shoulders on himself all the sin of the world, John 1, 29. He who knew no sin became sin for us. From 1 Corinthians. Sinless Jesus was a sinner, as you know, for our sake. And so David, when he's speaking about his sin, interestingly enough, as a prophet, talked about in Acts, professing the coming of the Messiah, was talking about the Christ bearer who would bear David's sin, who would bear your sin, my sin, and the sin of all generations to follow the coming of the Christ on this earth. 
when we look at some individuals that we know all too well, that were also just like us, sinners, we have some unique things. And I want, you to re- I want to read something from Martin Luther, because I think he coins this really well, and he's going to go across here from top to bottom. I quote Martin. When the merciful Father saw that we were being oppressed through the law, that we were being held under a curse, the curse of the law means eternal death, and that we should not be liberated from it by anything, he sent his Son into the world and heaped all the sins of men upon him, and he said to his Son, as an analogy here, be Peter the denier, Jesus, be Paul the persecutor, the blasphemer, and the assaulter in the middle top frame, be David on the far right top, the adulterer, the sinner who ate the apple in paradise, the bottom middle, the thief on the cross, the far left, and then Christ, the one who bore it all on the bottom far right. Peter, Paul, David, the thief on the cross, Adam and Eve, who began the start of original sin, and Christ, who bore it all. This is from Luther's lectures on Galatians 3.13. Christ is the sin bearer for all of us. And on the cross, he also says this about Christ. And you'll find these words, I think, unique. I find Christ, that is him, a sinner who takes upon himself the sins of all men. I do not see any other sins than those that lie in him. Therefore, let him die on the cross. Profound words, aren't they, coming from Martin Luther? Let him die on the cross because, therefore, it so attacks him and it kills him. But by this deed, the whole world is purged and expiated, that is, released from all evil, from all sins, and thus is set free from eternal death and from every evil. We know that answer. But it's interesting how Luther coins it. I find him a sinner, a sin bearer, who died and put everything, thankfully, on his shoulders for us. So he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And so us. When we're stained, when our hands feel stained by the shame of our sins, we reflect back on where we've messed up and continue to mess up in life. When we have guilt and we feel sort of shackled by that guilt and we can't escape from it, we have to know that when we look at this cross, we're looking at our sins hanging right there, gone, destroyed, dead with Christ, raised as a new creature as he rose from the dead, and we look forward to that resurrection. So when you put your hand in your, or your head in your hand, when you lean down in remorse, and when you're rather depressed and discouraged, really think through and go back to where your sins really lie. They no longer are your burden. They became the burden of Christ in this Lenten season, in his death on the cross. And that's our joy. That's why we can say with David, I am a sinner. Be gracious to me. And God is gracious and has been gracious to all of us. Now, one thing I want to take you through here, and this is a little bit long, so I'm going to go to my slide where I can theoretically read it. This is from Luke 13, 1 to 5. And the reason I bring this up with all these little lines and circles is because this talks about what often plagues us, which when we see a sin like David and we see God having direct punishment for that sin, we could theoretically or actually draw the conclusion that, man, when I sin and it's a big sin, I'm going to be directly punished. Not always true. Christ here says, there were some present at the very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had actually mingled with their sacrifices. Pilate went out and killed some Galileans. um, And that was being talked about to Christ. Christ answered them, do you think these Galileans were any worse sinners than the other Galileans? He's trying to say, God does not always, as we read through this, do a tit for a tat. So don't take every one of your sins and assume when something happens to you that's not really good and you're suffering for it, that it's directly because of your sin. God's will is unique. He could have saved the child of David, which is why David actually wore sackcloth, why he fasted, why he was praying to God for God's will. But it doesn't always turn out that way either, does it? God's will is not our will, says the Lord. He goes on here. No, but unless... I can't probably read all this. I think my print's too small for me. Uh, When you recently, you were to likewise perish. Excuse me. 
I do have glasses, but I should I, I type this in really micro print. Oh, those eighteen on whom the law of Scripture and the Sabbath were killed there in Siloam. Actually, by the pool of Siloam, there were eighteen killed. And do you think that they were any worse offenders than the others that were around that pool and didn't die? And Christ is saying, no, they weren't. But he says, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for repentance. So in David, what did we see? A repentant heart. He's still got a consequence. You may and we may get consequences for our sin. That's part of our broken world today. But it isn't a tit for a tat. So don't go down that path when suffering hits your life and make a direct 100% correlation. That's why God's punishing me. That isn't it. He wants us and he refines us with that suffering, as you know. But he says, except ye repent, I will be gracious to you. And he was. And he was gracious to David. And David had Solomon. And Solomon became a great king, as we know. So, forgiveness is there when we have Christ. And forgiveness is there when intimately today we get a chance to eat and drink his body and his blood. To be one with Christ, who bore all our sins, who carried it, so that we should get rid of our guilt, we should get rid of those shackles around our feet, we should clean or feel our hands are clean, not full of shame, because of his death, and most importantly, his resurrection, that we celebrate on Easter morn. In the name of Christ, please, Lord, be gracious to us sinners. In his name, amen.